Welcome to the 30-Minute Hour. It's the weekly podcast where we discuss business, sports, politics, and whatever's on our mind. I'm your host, Eric Twig, your procrastination prevention partner. I'm also the author of The Discipline of Now, 12 Practical Principles to Overcome Procrastination. <laughs> <laughs> it always gets a reaction <laughs> when I bring up my book. Oh my goodness. The joining me as always is Ted Fells. He's the business strategist extraordinaire, the super CEO and all around good guy. Hello all. All right. <laughs> also joining us in studio. In stu- without cake. In studio without cake. Without cake. Right. He's Britton Smith. He's our Renaissance man. He's the political pundit. He's yeah. got other titles we can't even mention in no, the interest that's, of time. That's but he's the man who refuses to be pigeonholed. Man, it's good to see you, man. Yeah, coming in live and direct. Yeah, man. In the flesh. Welcome, welcome. Live, direct, in flesh. Britton Smith is in the building. What's going on, man? What brought you to the area today? Well, you know, the show. We got a great guest. We, yes, we got did. a very mm-hmm. interesting guest. So you guest. thought you were going to come on in here in person for this one. Yeah, I, I had to be here for this one. This is a conversation I couldn't have over the phone. I wouldn't want to have to try to double dutch in over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I like to see you double dutch, so that'd be pretty fun. Two time champion. <laughs> Melville Avenue, Chicago Gym. Yeah. You, know. <laughs> you never know. Just wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. You were a two time double dutch champion. He truly is a renaissance man. <laughs> <laughs> man. I would pay to see you double double Dutch. <laughs> I would love to see that. Oh yeah, yeah. No, well, look, um, I'll uh, I'll do it right after the step show. Right after the step show. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right after. Yeah. That'll be good. Bro. That'll be my contribution. We we do the thirty minute hour live. Oh oh yeah. He does the step show routine. I do. Double Dutch. Oh, man. Craig, you got to be available to record that. <laughs> yeah, let, let's good. get that on camera. Absolutely. All right. Well, I've got something that's on my mind. All right. All right. That's right. I, I want to talk to you. This really ties into our guest who's sitting beside us, and we'll, we'll get into this really interesting dialogue. But I want to talk about the danger of checking the box. Mm-hmm. That's right, Britain. The danger <laughs> of checking the box. <laughs> right. I serve as a staunch advocate. <laughs> checking the box. Don't be a box checker. Right, whatever you do, don't do that. So let me, let me throw this scenario at you. What if I offered you $100,000 to jump out of a perfectly good 747 airplane? There's only one catch. Without a parachute. Would you do it? Can't do it. Won't do it. Can't do it. Won't do it. Hmm. Okay. And, and you would probably keep saying no and get frustrated with me if I kept asking you, right? And I wouldn't do it. So now, what if I told you that 747 was on the ground? That's what I was there we go. Yeah, I'm all in. There we go. Right. I'm pushing you out. <laughs> right. I'm double dutch now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You double that you now. Oh man! So what just happened? So so you just made a major decision without having all the information. Mm-hmm. Millennials. And as a result, <laughs> you just left a lot of money on the table. Mm. So that's the same thing we talk about checking the box. So organizations and individuals that don't embrace diversity, they're making major decisions every day without having all of the information possible. And as a result, they're leaving money on the table. Mm. So here's the danger of uh, checking that box. You box yourself in, mm. right? And what can we do? Now, that's the question. What can we do to keep from boxing ourselves in and being in this situation? And that's the question you had, Ted. I know that's, well, that's what I was thinking. It's on well, your I mean, mind. I mean, what can we do to keep ourselves from Right, great question. I'm glad you asked me that. Here's what you need to do. Here's the big takeaway to remember. You have to embrace a different perspective. Mm. You have to embrace a different perspective. And I just quick story uh, from my own personal perspective. One of the best, I've invested in coaches over the years to help me with the business, to help me with speaking. And 
one of the best coaches I ever invested in, I, I was in this box. Because he was like 15 years younger than me. Mm. I mean, he was literally, I was in my early 40s at the time, so he's in his mid-20s. Mm. And he's going to be coaching me mm. on the speaking business. Mm. And all these thoughts are going through my mind, like, hey, you know, why should I invest? And this guy's just out of college, da 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 Finally, I did. I didn't check the box. And it was the best decision I ever made. One idea he gave me literally paid his entire fee. Wow. And I would have missed out if I was just thinking. Because here's the thing. When people, it's not just we think about diversity. It's someone that's a different race. But it could be someone that's younger. It could be someone that's got a different background. You know, someone that, you know, you're a capital, I'm a Q. That's diversity. I'm an alpha. You're not for the diversity. All right. Uh, okay. So now we're, we're going three directions here. Yeah. Three different <laughs> all directions. Right, all right. All right. But the body, it's like the plane. I mean, you're, you're leaving money on the table because you're missing out on critical information that can help you to move forward. So very important. Make sure we don't check the box. Our guest today is going to help us with that. He's going to make sure we don't check the box. You get, you get really good with these. Yeah, these yeah. So, uh, At first, I thought he just didn't like boxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's something against boxes. I thought this guy had something against boxes. Not, no clubhouse for him. Sure. You know? <laughs> So he's going to help us to embrace a different perspective. We want to look at this from the organizational perspective, and we're going to look at this from the individual. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. We're going to look at it both ways. He, he's a bad man. Yeah. So, so he teaches sports law, civil procedure, and employment discrimination. He is among the nation's foremost sports law authorities. He's the author of Advancing the Ball, Race Reformation and the Quest for Equal Coaching Opportunity in the NFL. Mm. Uh, he has a particular interest in sports impact on society with a principal focus on racial and gender dynamics. He's been widely recognized for his excellence as both an advocate and an outstanding teaching and the Washington, he, he, he received an award uh, with, from the Washington College of Law for excellence in teaching. He's uh, also a frequent media contributor and has provided commentary for numerous media outlets, including CNN, BBC, NBC, MSNBC, Fox, and ESPN, and now... The 30 minute hour. Let me tell you, this, this gentleman must have a lot going on because this is the most difficult time I ever seen. Uh, I had it. <laughs> We're reading that doc. I tell you. You would have thought those were boxes on the paper. The way he was, was tagging those challenges. words. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. And we just found out he's a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Alpha right. Gamma Chapter. All right. Alpha Gamma yes. Chapter. Fantastic. Right. Welcome. Please join me in welcoming to the 30-minute hour, Professor Jeremy Duru. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Yeah. Brent and Ted, thank you for having me. All right. It's an honor and a privilege to have you here. Yeah, honor to be here. All right. CNN, MSNBC, I mean, all the 30-minute hour. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> minute hour. We can now add our name to that yes, sir. illustrious list. Yes, sir. And right. if you don't get around to it, we'll just go to the Wikipedia and <laughs> do it ourselves. <laughs> 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 all right. So when you set foot on Brown University's campus, did you have any idea that you'd be doing what you're doing today? No. No, I had no idea. Um, when I set foot on Brown University's campus, I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. Um, I hadn't thought about working in sports at all. Um, but I knew I wanted to do something in civil rights. And I then went to law school. And while in law school, got further going in that direction. Uh, and I clerked for a judge, was a civil rights judge. He studied under Thurgood Marshall, my judge did, wow. uh, at Howard. Um, and I started practicing at a large law firm, felt quite uh, disenchanted with it. I didn't feel like I was doing anything that was really you know, feeding my passions, mm-hmm. you know, serving my heart. And um, so I left there to go to a small civil rights law firm doing employment discrimination work, finally getting back to what I wanted to do all along. Mm-hmm. And just as I got there, 
they um, had heard from some coaches in the National Football League, this is back in 2003, mm -hmm. um, about concerns with um, elevation as a consequence of race. Mm -hmm. And so I was asked to work on that matter. And that is what turned me in the direction um, that I'm in now. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing, ever since I had that opportunity to recognize that there's this intersection of sport and race mm -hmm. where I can be active, mm -hmm. I've just clung on to that and pursued it. Excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. So if you could get your time machine and go back to Brown University with the knowledge you have now, talk to yourself, what advice would you give yourself? Um, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, in this regard, in other regards, maybe study a little harder from, you know, starting my sophomore year, kind of slacked up a little bit. But in this regard, you know, I'm, a, I'm a believer kind of in, um, uh, in faith, you mm. know, and, and the path um, and that maybe is laid out for you to some extent. So I don't know if I would have done anything differently. I have to say I feel extraordinarily blessed and fortunate to be doing the work I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps had I done something differently, I wouldn't have ended up where I am. I'm very happy where I am. So I'm not sure I'd do anything uh, differently in terms of my, my career path, Eric. Okay. All right, good. So it ended up the way it was supposed to, the twists and turns. Got yeah. Through. By the grace of God, I made mm. some mistakes here and there, but I feel, uh, I feel very fortunate and blessed to be where I am. That's great. So good. So just kind of elaborate a little more on, you know, what is it specifically about this whole racial dynamic and racial equality issues that kind of get, got you interested and in jazzed up? Sure. So, I mean, I've been, I kind of, well, I've studied it for a while. I, I remember very distinctly when I was in the eighth grade, my older brother was in the 11th grade. And um, I don't know, I'd seen the name Malcolm X somewhere. Mm. And I asked him who Malcolm X was. Mm. and he was shocked that I didn't know mm. and made fun of me a little bit and told me he wasn't going to tell me. I had to mm. find out on my own. Mm. So I went you know, went to the library and did some reading and learned about, about Malcolm X. And now I'd known some other things about you know, um, African-American revolutionary movements in this country, but I hadn't known anything about Malcolm. But it, just, it was a big moment for me because I realized there was something, there was like a piece of my education that was totally missing. Mm. Um, and so from there on, I continued to gather steam, um, seeking to learn more about the black experience in this country, but also the black experience worldwide. Um, and as I said, so that propelled me through my education. And as I said, once I found the sports hook, that's when I really got um, jazzed up. And I think the reason I really got jazzed up there is because I believe that sports provides an extraordinary platform for mm. things. Mm. Uh, you know, most people in this country and in the world follow sport to some extent. Um, uh, most of my work is, uh, as I think you referenced the book I wrote, is in the National Football League. And for better or for worse, it remains the most popular league in this country. So if you're going to attack a racial issue or explore solutions to racial discrimination, in the National Football League than you're doing in the place where everybody can see what you're doing. Mm, yeah. And so if you have some success with it, then maybe mm. you're creating a little bit of a template mm. that others can use in other industries. So that's why I'm really excited about this sort of work. Hmm. So now how do you feel that sports has impacted society when it comes to the racial and the gender dynamics? Oh, man, I mean, you know, it, it, <clears throat> how far do you want to go back? I mean, we can go back to... You know, Jesse Owens. When you hear the name Jesse Owens, um, <clears throat> you may not know what four events he won gold medals in, but you're going to know that he did it under Hitler's nose in mm. Berlin in those Olympics. Mm. You know, you go to, to, to Jackie Robinson in 47, the year before that, 1946, when the National Football League was integrated. Um, you, know, pe you know, people during the Civil Rights Movement uh, credited some of those early sports pioneers as certainly not doing the heaviest lifting, mm. but of um, creating the optics that made it seem like it really was possible to have a desegregationist outlook. That you know, if we mm. could actually play on the same fields together, then maybe indeed it's conceivable that people can go to the same schools and live in the same neighborhoods, mm. um, uh, you know, etc. And so, you know, we're talking about gender, if we're talking about, I don't know if, if viewers know Billie Jean King. Tremendous tennis player, woman who uh, did more for gender equity than a hundred politicians could have done through her playing tennis and the platform she got there. So, in so many different ways, I think, and you know, currently 
as we're dealing with um, uh, you know, something I write about, the effort to reduce discrimination and and head coach hiring, mm. um, I believe, and we'll talk more about some of the initiatives perhaps that, we, that have been implemented, but I believe that those initiatives have now had an impact outside of sport and indeed outside of this country mm. with respect to under, um, other under-resourced populations. And so, uh, you know, I've, it, because it's got this sort of platform, if you can get involved in it and you can seek equality in it, then you're making a difference, in my view, beyond just that particular you know, data point that you're dealing with. Hmm. Okay. So, like the Rooney Rule, for example. Sure. Yeah. Like, how do you feel that that has, or have you seen that impact other arenas outside of football? Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'll tell the, group, the viewers about the Rooney Rule, exactly yeah. what it is. So, yeah. The, yeah. so the Rooney Rule um, is a rule that the National Football League created in 2003. It was actually an outgrowth of the matter that I mentioned to you that got me started thinking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Those coaches became an organization called the Fritz Pollard Alliance and mm -hmm. pushed for the Rooney Rule. Mm -hmm. So I've been involved with this since then. So it's a rule that if you're going to hire a head coach, you have to interview a person of color in the National Football League. And it's now been expanded that if you're going to hire a general manager, you have to interview a mm -hmm. person of color as well. Um, so it has had an impact on the National Football League over the years. Now, in recent years, there's been some mm. entrenchment, I guess. Some numbers have gone down. We've not seen the sort of mm. progress that we'd like to see, and there's been a fair bit of controversy around it and criticism of uh, the, the owners in the league, owners of clubs, which I think is valid criticism. Um, but it has had a positive impact over the years. And other entities, going to the kind of the thesis that I offered initially, have picked up on that and adopted it. So any number of tech companies um, have a form of the Rooney Rule. Facebook mm -hmm. does, Pinterest does, Intel, Xerox. Mm -hmm. They have a form. Goldman Sachs adopted a form of the Rooney Rule uh, within the last year. Um, uh, Chuck Schumer on the Democratic side of the Senate um, pushed for and now has a rule that if you're going to interview, if you're going to hire a staffer, any center mm -hmm. hiring a staffer has to interview a person of color. Mm -hmm. Once the Senate did that, now the Democrats on the, in the House uh, uh, have done it. Yeah. Um, the uh, National Soccer Program in the United Kingdom, which is kind of the home of, of, uh, of soccer uh, in Europe, some would argue with that, but you know it's where the game was born. Um, they now have a rule that if you are going to have a head coach for the women's or the men's teams at, at the junior levels, like you know the U15, U16, going all the way up to the senior squad, you have to interview a person of color. And so the Rooney Rule has bled outside mm -hmm. of the league um, and is having an impact on all these different is industries. And so, um, you know, it's been gratifying to work on because I think it has proven, at least to some extent, the thesis that if you really attack racial discrimination in a high-profile industry, other industries look at it and maybe at least consider the initiatives that you're employing, whether they adopt or not. Who knows? That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm glad you, you brought in a, another uh, a, a arena, and as you mentioned, uh, what the Senate did is what the House did. Uh, recently, we've seen with the um, Democratic uh, presidential candidates, we've seen the most diverse field mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, and as a result of the wear and tear of the campaign, a lot of different factors in the campaign life, we're now down to three 70 plus year old white males and a 70 plus year old of a woman who a white woman all from the Northeast um, even though we've had the most diverse field racially um, through gender through sexual orientation yeah. um, but if you want to use that notion that this is still the will of the people and it's whittling, the field is whittling down to the will of the people. What does that say to you? Well, we could talk hours and <laughs> days about this. Um, I don't know what it says. I'm not sure what it says. I mean, I think that, I think it says that it is very difficult for um, a person of color, uh, a woman, an openly gay person to gain traction on the national stage. I think it says that. Um, I think it shows that there, you know, um, you know. I remember the early days of President Obama's tenure. People talked about what well, was another post-racial era because 
President Obama is the president. If he could get elected, then we're not really having a racial conversation. Mm -hmm. I think that has been rebutted in any number of ways over the course of um, the last several years, but this is another example. You know, it's just hard to get that sort of uh, uh, traction. Notwithstanding the fact that we know, um, and <clears throat> the studies quite clearly show across many industries, that when you have a diverse group um, uh, involved making a decision, management level, you are likely to get the best outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, but in this circumstance, we're seeing that, yeah, you put it properly, Britain, it's been whittled down in a way that's, that's um, uh, kind of um, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> resulted in, um, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, um, we've lost the diversity yeah. that was so beautiful at the beginning of the, uh, you know, the Democratic uh, nomination process. Mm. And the term I know you're familiar with is called collective intelligence, right? That, you know, we've got a diverse group of people that collective intelligence goes up. Everybody yeah. gets smarter. Right. And, you know, diversity has now become a buzzword with all of these companies. We have to value diversity. But how do we get to the point where we're just not checking the box? How do we get to the point where we actually value the inputs from other people? Well, it's interesting you say that. I mean, I feel like checking the box... Uh, often prevents us from getting there. That is mm -hmm. to say, if it's a checking the box situation, and you're checking the box, you're contemplating, you know, hiring a person, or maybe you're checking the box and bringing somebody into a peripheral type role, um, and consequently, you're not getting the collective intelligence bump that you get if you don't check the box, mm -hmm. and you're intentional about bringing that person in and giving them, um, you know, a principal uh, role. So checking the box is, um, it is uh, disingenuous. Uh, it is damaging. Mm -hmm. It is hurtful to um, those individuals the box is checked against or with. Mm -hmm. um, it is hurtful to the entity checking the box because mm -hmm. now they're not benefiting the, from the positive um, collective uh, intelligence bump that you're referencing, uh, Eric. So checking the box is a bad thing. It's, an, um, uh, it's you know the thing that bothers me most about checking the box is that. I think those who check the box fail to realize that doing so cuts against their own interest. Mm. It ends up being an irrational thing to do. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And that's interesting because I think about, you know, with the NFL, right? And you have it, you know, you hear with these coaching vacancies and you see all these, you know, these great coaches out there. And then it's like, okay, well, you know, yeah, you got to at least see one minority mm. coach. So, yeah, we're going right, to have Britain come in here. Yep, we saw Britain. Like, It'd be good to know, even though I know that information probably is not shared. Of okay, well, how did that interview really go with Britt, and why did you select Joe? Well, it's interesting you say that because um, the why did you select Joe part? Yeah, um, I don't know if anybody saw the press conference uh, that the Carolina Panthers had, mm -hmm. where their owner uh, talked about their new head coach. Mm -hmm. And basically the theme of it was, um, and it was in, you know, I think it was in comments outside of the press conference as well, but the theme of it was, I saw me in him. Oh, you know, wow. I saw me in this guy. And, wow. and I just felt like, you know, <laughs> he could go. come in, he could do it, and so yeah. on and so forth. And so obviously it goes to your point. I mean, if that's if that's going to be the criteria, the criteria <laughs> yeah. then, you know, I mean, it, right. it, it, you know, it becomes much harder for those who don't who are not, who do not present like yeah. him in any number of ways. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that spans, as you talked about how this uh, bleeds into so many different uh, areas of life, mm. of so many different industries, I think that's kind of true even as we talked about the uh, Democratic Party. When you have the people who are applying, when they don't reflect the people who they're applying for or applying to, then it's hard to combat that whole concept of are we still just checking the box until there's some um, level of until there are some owners mm. that look differently mm. until there are some owners of the means of production across various yeah. industries yeah. that look differently uh, because again the hiring process there you know I look more like my boss. You know who who yeah. who who hired me because he saw some things in me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, you want to argue that 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 that, that was you know that there's something wrong with that, mm -hmm. but that's how I got my shot. Yeah. And 
until that there's a there's a difference in that ownership level, in that top level. Uh, you know, while we say, yeah, it's great being a player, but we need more coaches. Mm-hmm. And it's great being a coach, but we need some GMs. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. if we can get some folks at the highest yeah. level, then we can start putting more people in play. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. That's and, a great point. And, and great point. That's a great point. And, and uh, you know, thinking that, so, so um, I work with the Fritz Pollard Alliance, which I mentioned still. I counsel yeah. them. And we've been thinking a lot about ownership. So right now in the National Football League, there's one, one owner of color. Saad Khan, he's mm-hmm. owner of Jacksonville Jaguars, Pakistani, and there's no African American owner in the mm-hmm. league. <clears throat> Do you all know what it what's involved in becoming an owner? Do you have yeah. an idea how much cash is required? Oh. Well, I can only imagine. Oh. Let me tell you, you have to have thirty percent of the cost of the club in cash. Liquid. Wow. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about me and my 50 friends or me and my two friends, and we're not talking about leveraging it. You have to have the cash there. So the general partner has to have about $800 million mm. in liquid in yeah. order to become an NFL owner. So You just missed that, Brendan. I did. Yeah, we'll, I did. Uh, but next quarter. <laughs> keep, 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 get, you're close. Keep doing that double dutching. Get some two and throw dollars at you, man. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. If I'd have just, if I'd have just jumped off that plane, <laughs> right? That's right. right. Yeah. That would have helped. Eight hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> that would have helped. Right. Have helped. Yeah. 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 So you know, so there are very few people in the world who mm-hmm. can meet that threshold. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for any number of reasons connected to systemic racism and such, over the course of black people's existence in this country, you can mm-hmm. imagine how few African Americans. Mm-hmm. You know, meet that threshold, and so that's a tough nut to crack. Now there are a few, and if we started talking, we could probably name them just right. sitting here. You know, um, we're talking about Oprah Winfrey type money is what yeah. we're talking about, and so mm-hmm. it's it's very challenging to get, you know, to crack that nut at the ownership level, and so we still have to pursue it. Um, but short of that, I think it goes to what something Eric said is, which is you know the collective intelligence of organizations. You know, if you can have a, a person of color, you know, in the C-suite who can be a part of the interviews mm-hmm. for the coaches or for the GMs, then we're in a situation where you're starting to increase the collective intelligence, mm-hmm. think more broadly about things, and maybe have, um, uh, you know, a different attitude toward who you're contemplating hiring. Right now, there's not a, a, a forget about owners, you know, there's not a, a, a president, a black president in the league. And there never has been. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It never has been. The closest person was a guy named Kevin Warren. He was a COO of the Minnesota Vikings. Never everybody thought he'd become a president. Um, but he didn't have the opportunity. Now he's going to be the commissioner of the Big Ten. So he's now the first mm-hmm. black commissioner um, of a Power Five conference mm-hmm. rather than the first black president of an NFL club. Mm-hmm. Um, so those, you know, uh, that, that decision-making level, is extraordinarily non-diverse, which is part of the reason that the outcomes, the outputs of decision-making tend to be quite non-diverse. Hmm. Hmm. So tell us about your book, Advancing the Ball. Yeah, so Advancing the Ball, which I wish I had to put up right next to your lovely book there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry I didn't bring a copy of it. Um, Eric, it a, Eric, uh, Eric has another stand for guests that do bring their book. But right, well, he also has another book. <laughs> or the other thing. Right. Right. Well, we're going to try to Photoshop my book into That's this right. somehow. That's right. Available on Amazon and everywhere else. That's right. Uh, That's right. No, so it's, it's called Advancing the Ball, and it is the exploration of the movement to increase diversity among coaches in the National Football League. And it tracks back um, to Fritz Pollard, mm-hmm. who um, is the first African American head coach mm-hmm. in the National Football League. Mm-hmm. Decades and decades before Art Shell. So Art Shell was the yeah. second. Fritz Pollard did it in 1921. It's a great document- documentary. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank to, you. To look at. There's an NFL network documentary that's still running called A, F- a Forgotten Man about his life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so tracking back to his life, the book explores um, in narrative for, uh, um, form. It's, you know, I view it, I tried to write it as a view it as a page turner. It explores the movement to increase the number of black coaches in the National Football League. And it kind of culminates when Tony Dungy and Lovey Smith mm. met in 2007 in the Super Bowl, when they were the first two blacks to be in the Super Bowl mm. as head coaches. They faced each other. They were longtime friends. Mm-hmm. Um, Lovey Smith was a mentee of Tony Dungy. Oh, wow. um, and so it really is an extraordinary story. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so what advice do you have for that follower we may have? They're a minority and they feel like they're being denied opportunities in their company mm -hmm. just because they're of their minority status. What, what advice do you have for them? So, uh, you know, obviously would differ based on the context of the organization. I'm not sure if it's an organization where there is a group of minorities who feel similarly. Um, if that's the case, then um, affinity groups are an extraordinary mm. means of gathering together, gathering strength together and presenting mm -hmm. a united front, but also uh, supporting each other, um, you know, in down times. Um, if there isn't that sort of support, it's harder. Um, perhaps you can get it from other a actors in the industry um, uh, at what you would think are competing entities, but in fact, um, you can cooperate with those individuals uh, there who are of color, who are seeking the same things uh, that you're seeking. Ultimately, um, if those sorts of strategies are not successful, um, uh, keep in mind I'm a you know I'm a lawyer, so sometimes I'll drop <laughs> back to the the litigation possibility yeah. which exists. Yeah. You know, there's a statute um, called Title Seven, Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that prevents discrimination in employment in any number of realms, including race and color, nationality, mm. uh, and also prevents retaliation against somebody who brings a suit on those grounds or who forms an affinity group uh, to assist with progress for people of color. So litigation is always a possibility. It can be a difficult road, but um, those laws exist for a reason. Hmm. So, so kind of expand on that a little. You talk about affinity groups, where this is where people just kind of join together and meet yeah. and kind of, kind of expand on that. Yeah, so, so the Fritz Pollard Alliance, which I've referenced, mm -hmm. is an affinity group. So mm -hmm. it is... A membership organization of coaches, scouts, and front office executives um, in the National Football League who are of color. And um, they meet every year. They meet at the Senior Bowl down in Alabama, Mobile, Alabama, in January. They meet at the Combine every year, um, and often at the Super Bowl as well to come together to exchange ideas, to talk about how they can help each other, how they can work together to, you know, uh, rise the tide and lift all boats. Um, and it doesn't have to be the case that you're in the National Football League to have such um, an affinity group. And any sort of entity where you exist, when there are other people who are faced with some of the same challenges that you're faced with, um, you can come together and talk about uh, common strategies and sometimes present a united and strong front in challenging what may be discrimination or, if not discrimination, um, otherization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherization. 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 <laughs> so it may not, you know, it, which may also be discrimination, right. but it may yeah. just also be, you know, kind of um, being set off to the side, mm -hmm. um, being categorized with the other folks mm -hmm. as opposed to the folks who are actually making moves and, mm -hmm. yeah. and wielding power. Mm. So, Britain, you know, you know, Eric, you know, is, you know, kind of goes out, does his thing from time to time. We're not included, so we oh, no. want to yeah. let our own. Affinity group. Yeah. So Eric has otherized you. Oh, boy. oh, no, oh has he? Oh, so oh, now, now let, let's stop here. I, I feel like <laughs> I've been otherized. You know, we got a little Kappa theme on the other, the other side of the table here. You're you Kappa know. Jim Absolutely. Oh, wow. So they got us out of number. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but, Trey. Yeah. Kappa, Alpha, Q, Sigma, none of them. All right. So. Uh, yeah. Right, no. well, he, what he didn't tell you was, this is show number... 47. 47. 47 episodes. Of those 47 episodes, how many episodes have had Q guests? Of, of the 47? Yeah. 20. 20. Out of those... <laughs> this, is, this is what I'm talking about. I, out of those 47, <laughs> how many have had either graduates or somebody that might have attended Hampton University? 17. Merely, <laughs> merely a coincidence, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would say that as a, as a matter of statistical significance, Eric, that that's not a coincidence. It's not looking good for me. No, it's not it's looking good. good. Got the no, expert, no. he said it's not looking good. <laughs> All right, we need to revisit some of our practices. That's right. Yeah. Oh, we, Is that what we're saying? Yeah. <laughs> we get a week out of the pending group. Oh, yeah, we're going to change that. But, but now, so, so what can employers, you know, people that own their businesses, what are some things, what are some steps they can take to send that message that they're an equal opportunity employer? 
Well, first they can say they're an equal opportunity employer yes. and tout yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. I'll make that clear to candidates and everybody who's listening. Yeah. Um, uh, but the biggest thing is to recognize, you know, and I, you know, I think um, McKinsey and Company's done a study on this. We got one out of Forbes. We came out of Harvard. It really is the case for those out there who are still questioning it. This, um, uh, this idea of diversity strengthening decision making is pretty well documented and supported. So I think the key thing is for employers to actually think about that and think about the way in which being intentional about diversity can improve their bottom line. We're not just talking about altruism. Now, you know, it's important that we all do the right thing. I Absolutely. believe strongly in that. I think we all do. Right. Um, but if you're dealing with someone who um, just finds it hard to do the right thing, mm. well, then let them appeal to their own self-interest. Mm. It may, you know, it may Absolutely. be the right thing right. to to cast a wide net, but let's say you're not into doing the right thing, or you're, you know, whatever, holding you back, then think about your own self-interest. You will benefit from, in this case, doing the right thing. Mm. And I think we need to drive that point home to folks. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, otherwise, you are being an irrational actor. Mm. Mm. And, you know, if you're being an irrational actor, then you might as well just, you know, go back home because you're yeah. not going to be productive. And there's all kinds of studies out there that say inclusive companies do better on the yeah. bottom line and everything else. Well, so. you know, absolutely. So, you know, it's. I just think if you're running a business and you're not thinking about being inclusive, mm -hmm. then you're being foolish and foolhardy and um, negatively impacting yourself, which yep. no rational actor would do. So. Mm -hmm. So, so what's next on the horizon for you? Um. <clears throat> Well, not entirely sure. Um, I, uh, I, um, I don't know. I kind of like the horizon I'm sailing. You know, I basically, I guess, I guess as I think about this, the, the, I'm, I'm the good. horizon I'm, I'm know. sailing towards now, <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I've not yet gotten there. You know what yeah, I'm saying? I've okay. not yet conquered it. Um, okay. I feel like there's a lot more for me to do with this intersection mm -hmm. um, in a few different regards. So I'm still writing books. Um, I... Um, Working on that going forward, I write, write articles that we, uh, as well, some of which aren't about, um, aren't at an intersection of race and sport, but are about sport. Otherwise, I wrote an article recently, a law review article that came out arguing for the elimination of heading from soccer at all levels uh, mm -hmm. because of brain trauma. Mm -hmm. I'm working on one right now that takes the youth sports industry to task um, and suggests that we adopt a youth sports system more like the Norwegian system. Mm -hmm. That is one that does not weed out uh, athletes early, doesn't have yeah. national competitions early. Um, uh, basically, it's healthier for young athletes and produces better athletes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm focused on those sorts of things, but I continue to do my work at the intersection of race and uh, sport. I'm um, doing a little more consulting than I used to, a little more speaking than I used to. Mm -hmm. um, continuing to work with the Fritz Pollard Alliance. Um, it's a it's a for those who haven't followed, the last three hiring cycles in the National Football League have been have been uh, disastrous, maybe too strong a word, but maybe it's not too strong a word. Mm. Um, and so we've got a lot of work to do in terms of trying to get um, uh, the league to be in a better spot. So I have to feel like i got to conquer this horizon first. Once yeah, I get this right. one taken care of, I'll step on to the next one, but don't want to leave this one too prematurely. Okay, okay yeah, it sounds like you're doing some great stuff. So, so what, and what's the best way for our followers to connect with you, to get your book, get more information? Okay. Um, so um, I'm, at, I'm on Twitter at njeremyduru.com. Uh, That's N and then Jeremy, J-E-R-E-M-I-D-U-R-U. Not that kind of what I'm talking about. Twitter, it's just at njeremyduru. Um, uh, you can always look me up at the university, uh, Washington College, American University of Washington College of Law. Uh, uh, I'm there. I'm on LinkedIn. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. We can connect uh, that way. My book is uh, on Amazon and you know, Bar you know, BarnesandNoble.com and the other uh, booksellers. Anywhere you find books, my book should be there. Mm -hmm. So come, come get me. I'm, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm excited to talk to folks. Get at your boy. Yeah, get at me. Yeah. Yeah. Get at me. Yeah. I love talking about this stuff. It's, and I feel I feel like I'm in the um, I'm rare and blessed position where. I tell folks that the, the books on my nightstand mm -hmm. um, are the same books I use for work. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So the things that I derive pleasure from intellectually are the things that I work on as well. Mm -hmm. And so this stuff, I'll talk about this stuff all day. Mm -hmm. All day. 
Yeah, that, that's certainly a great place to be. Yeah. yeah, very blessed. For sure. Yeah, so we're at the point of the show now. We're going to go around the horn. This is where we each give a closing shot for the people to remember us by. What's your closing shot for the good people? Well, I, I have to defer to you, Eric. I mean, you're the host. You go first. <laughs> you right? go I, first. I'll bring up the rear. You want to bring up the rear? Unless you tell me otherwise. I am, you know, after all, not a Q. I mean, you know, he manipulates. That's right. Yeah. right. That's how you do it. That's you get it. That's so right. So you get it. You're telling me that yeah, I got to go There's some otherisms going on in this room right about that. Now we've got the, the guest yeah. joining in on it. we got to with the attorney. Yeah. 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 We've sought counsel. That's right. We didn't mean We didn't tell you, but that's really Don't talk to my clients. I'll talk to me. So I'm an equal opportunity questioner. Let me put it out to you like that. So, so who would li- who would like to go first? Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> right? That's the theme. Equal That's opportunity. Good, good job. Good job. I'll take this. Right. I'll go first. Excellent. Um, this past weekend, um, I went down to uh, Selma, Alabama for the 55th mm-hmm. anniversary of the Bloody Sunday March, March Across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that we're talking about this uh, because, again, a lot of times the question still arises, why are we still marching? Why are we still you know, recognizing this as civil rights, we're in that post-civil rights era. We're in that post-race era. Um, and it's a great for a millennial, a person who was not there, who was not around, to see a lot of the injustices. Like Jamie pointed out earlier, we're still seeing first uh-huh. in mm-hmm. 2020. Yeah. We're still conquering first. We still have yet to see many more first. Mm-hmm. And so as I had the opportunity to be with uh, David Marion, yeah. uh, uh, Grand Bosses of Omega Sci Fi, and uh, Friday, uh, Ward, Everett Ward, who's the uh, general president of uh, Alpha Alpha, and our Grand Pole Mark, and all the other members of the Divine Nine leading that group. It's still so many, it, there's still so many, it's ironic that we marched across the bridge, mm. but there's still so many more miles to go mm. uh, to as we're seeing the need for more first and more inclusion and more. Representation. Awesome. Excellent. Kid, would you like to go next? I like going after Britain. Britain always <laughs> been having some. It's tough to follow that. Oh, it's tough. Man, yeah, it's tough. Man. That's, how, that, that's extraordinary yeah. that you went down. Yeah. Now that's good stuff. Absolutely. That's yeah. really extraordinary. The Renaissance man. Refuse to be pitched on. <laughs> a good way to be. So just in talking about all this um, kind of, you know, the inclusiveness, right? And I'm thinking about just, you know, the industry that I'm in, technology. And I think that's an area where mm-hmm. you have to be inclusive, right? Because the need for technology people, right? It's it, it, The shortage is so great, right? Mm-hmm. That, that you just, like, you're just trying to get them wherever you can get them, right? right? Yeah. Facebook, yeah. the Amazons, I mean, all the companies out here. I mean, we're looking for people that are in cybersecurity, right? Cloud computing, right? So I think in, in that space, I think that's a place that, you know, I think that companies are, you know, whether they want to or not, right? If they want to be able to to be competitive, that they're going to have to to kind of be o- more open to kind of this inclusion, right? So I think it's a it's a it's a good place to be in as far as technology yeah. goes. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I would just say. Um, First of all, I appreciate being on the show. I really enjoyed this. Um, I would just say that uh, kind of going to where Britain was, I don't, you know, I've just been thinking a lot that we are not as far along as we think we are, mm-hmm. you know? I, yeah. We're not as far along as I thought, you know, when I was a younger man, I thought we were farther along than we are. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I think we have to stay stalwart, you know, we have to stay committed. Um, Continue to engage in conversations like these. Mm. Be creative, mm-hmm. you know, about paths forward. Um, while at the same time doing what you did, Britain, and you know, remembering where we've been and going back um, mm-hmm. to gain inspiration mm-hmm. from where we've been, such that we can continue to press on moving forward. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Yeah, great thoughts. So, I mean, my closing thought is just again, it goes back to this idea of diversity, mm-hmm. and just a lot of the companies that I've either worked for, worked with, it, it was always, a, in my opinion, it was always a box check. Mm. It really wasn't, and it kind of went, something you said, you know, do it for your own self-interest. But I don't think people really understand that you will actually have a better organization if it's more diverse. Yeah. 
Yeah. Bottom line, it, it's been proven time and time again. So just understand that your organization will be better if you're getting input from people that don't look like you, don't vote like you, and may not even pray like you. Yeah. You know, I think we just have to be open-minded knowing that the outcomes will be better. Yeah. So, well, this has been an awesome episode yeah. of the 30-Minute Hour. Yeah. Uh, I guess he, he's dropped some knowledge on us. No, we, didn't, we, didn't a, we didn't ask that question that we always ask, though. Of, like, what's your day like, your normal day? Like, when you start your day? And okay, sure, kind of sure. Goes. So, so I'm academic, and so it all, it's, you know, it's always different. Um, so depending on how many classes I'm teaching this semester, one or two classes, um, yeah, I, may, I may start in the morning prepping for class. Teach a class, handle some office hours, and then do some writing. I try to be writing most every day, uh, but there'll be days when I have no classes to teach, mm -hmm. and I'll just be focusing on writing and maybe doing a little bit uh, uh, of speaking. Uh, and so it's it really is you know different every day. I'm actually on sabbatical this semester, mm -hmm. which means I have no classes to teach and I have no committee uh, assignments. I just am um, living the life of the mind. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm just thinking about stuff. Living the life of the mind. Yeah, so living the life, life, life of the mind. And, um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so, so yeah, man. Hashtag. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, <laughs> yes. uh, and I was good to just think about stuff from time to time. So really, in my you know line of work, it, you know, every day is a little bit different. It's one of the things that keeps it, you know, yeah. keeps it alive. Yeah. That's great. Well, fantastic. This has been an awesome episode of the Thirty Minute Hour. Again, keep in mind, it's not your everyday podcast. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram, on iTunes, on YouTube. Just type in the 30-minute hour into the search bar, and there you'll find us. We might be living the life of the mind. Living the life of the mind. Absolutely. <laughs> in case you don't have a copy of the book. <laughs> Until next time, have a great one.